Well, I have volunteered to talk about genetic risk in uh, prediction in disorders of aging. I was interested in risk prediction, disease risk prediction for a while. And lately I was mostly working for Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, neurodegenerative disorders. I have learned a few, few lessons and thought of uh, ways of overcoming difficulties in uh, prediction neurodegenerative disorders and um, would like to share it with you because I think the way uh, I think of combining, for example, common and rare variants for genetic risk prediction uh, could be applicable for any common uh, genetic disorders. Just to remind you that dementia is an umbrella uh, describing a set of um, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, AD is the uh, most common uh, type of dementia. And uh, like many other disorders of aging, it is a progressive condition, which means that uh, clinical features develop gradually over many years before the diagnosis. And therefore, the ability to predict disease risk before disease onset is of great importance for studying people for clinical trials or the selection of candidates for functional or experimental studies. Couple of facts about AD and why it is difficult to study that disease. Um, so 30% of clinically diagnosed AD cases have no neuropathological or biomarker character characteristics. 56% of cases defined as AD uh, present with uh, common comorbidities as Lewy body disease, vascular pathology or hippocampal sclerosis, et cetera. What is also nice, 35% uh, of la uh, lifetime risk of dementia is modifiable. So nutrition, good health care, managing vascular aspect, education may modify the uh, lifetime risk of dementia, delay age at onset, and leading to decreased incidence of dementia over the last decades. With the availability of large population samples, for example, UK by a bank, the use of population-based controls become a common um, uh, practice to boost the statistical power of genome-wide association studies. Uh, in uh, polygenic diseases like schizophrenia, for example, population controls are quite well, okay to use as the disease is quite rare, 2%, and manifests early in life. Uh, penetrance of uh, the phenotype is mostly complete, I don't know, you're better specially than me at about 40 years of age, while for Alzheimer's disease, even at 80, there are still individuals at risk who have not yet developed uh, the uh, Alzheimer's disease. So quite interesting disorder to study. Uh, from a, a couple of review papers, earlier papers, what is interesting also the APOE. APOE is a strong genetic risk factor uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the odds ratio is about three for E4 uh, allele carriers. And also what is interesting that the looking at age component, which people quite often um, not really pay much attention to, we can see that E2 allele frequencies, which is a protective allele, do not change with age. E4 allele frequencies go down with age. So it starts from 0. Point whatever 18%. Yeah, and goes up to uh, nine nine percent, uh, whereas E three allele frequencies go up. Also, APOE is a, a disease modifier um, uh, because what happens if you are APOE uh, carrier? So then you will likely to develop the disease in average at sixty eight years uh, of age. If you are non carrier. Uh, you are likely to develop a disease at 84 years of age. And uh, that, of, of course, reflects, uh, should reflect the study design and should reflect our way of um, uh, interpreting the results of genetic studies. What we looked at, uh, interestingly, uh, in our sample, it's a small sample of about 300 cases, 300 controls. Um, it's a sample from ADNI and ADMP um, uh, websites. Uh, why it is so small? Because we excluded all individuals which were uh, used for genome-wide AD genome-wide association studies uh, as a, in the study of Cancro et al. 2019. However, uh, I just wanted to look at the tendencies of uh, polygenic risk scores and APOE 
basically relationships in these samples. So when we look at the uh, overall sample, we can see similar picture, which I have shown you on a previous slide. So E2 allele frequencies kind of remain unchanged. Um, E4 allele frequencies go down with age, and E3 allele frequencies go up with age. Perfect. Now, when we look at cases and control separately, we also uh, uh, split now not only, well, we're looking at E4 frequency, and we're also looking at uh, values of polygenic list scores, which combines um, uh, uh, SNPs with P value up to 0 0.1 and also oligogenic risk score. I call it oligogenic risk score because that was introduced recently by Nsang et al. 2020. So basically looking at SNPs only with p-value 10 to minus 5, strongly associated. So what we see in cases, if all your frequencies go down with age, fine. Uh, Oligogenic risk score go down with age as well, whereas polygenic risk score goes up with age. And when you look at controls, Yes, E4 allele frequency go down too. However, in general, E4 uh, frequency is higher in cases and in controls. And then uh, polygenic risk score and oligogenic risk score remain kind of unchanged over, over, uh, over time. So this led us to understand why from the same um, uh, data, we can observe two different results, right? If you're looking at polygenic risk score, as it's usually called calculated, just put a pruning and thresholding or uh, precise uh, software. Then we look at upper year alone, which contributes to two SNPs only. Area under the curve is 70%, R squared uh, 0 0.18. When we add significant, uh, GVA significant SNPs, basically it remains the same. Uh, oligogenic risk score gain remains the same, and it goes down as we include more and more SNPs, like on a point of, uh, one uh, significance level, 68,000 SNPs, the, the accuracy went down. And that was an uh, observation similar to the one published in Sankt et al. 2020. When we uh, calculate PRS uh, without APOE, Region. So the whole upper region, about two megabases, is ex excluded just in case. Um, we observe uh, area under the curve and R squared actually, in fact, increasing when we include more SNPs. So that uh, led me to think perhaps if we use two variables separately when predicts uh, disease risk. So upper E, as it is basically some of the two allele frequencies with appropriate uh, weights, and PRS which is calculated at 0 0.1, for example, or whatever threshold we choose, the accuracy, in fact, behaves as we would expect. So it starts from 70% as before, and this increases up to 74%, the best accuracy in that small sample of 300 cases and 300 controls approximately. So um, that led us of thinking of um, modeling APOE separately from the rest of the PRS, and also, you will see my uh, results slightly later, how we think incorporating age into calculating the disease probability. Just to remind you, uh, looking at uh, overall heritability of Alzheimer's disease, APOE is a strong predictor, accounts between five and 9%. Uh, other genome-wide um, uh, significant uh, loss, say three to 8%. In addition to APOE, we have a number of other genetic variation and uh, there is no, uh, so far, um, consistent evidence in the field what is the other, how much of other genetic variation um, is explained by common SNPs. Some studies show about 10%, some studies show up to uh, 20, 30, 40%. So it depends on the sample, and perhaps aging component, in fact, can explain the differences. Um, what I wanted to talk today about, about the probability of Alzheimer's disease based, based on common and rare genetic variants together. We have just a good paper accepted uh, uh, in the Journal of Alzheimer's Research and Therapy. If you're interested, you can look at that. So because I was working with a mathematician and I'm a mathematician myself, don't look at these formulas because they are bulky. They are all explained in the paper. What you need to look here at. So yes, we calculate, um, uh, disease probability uh, uh, using linear regression with logic link function. That's, that's easy. So alpha and beta, that's what's important to look at here. So x is the value of individual's uh, uh, polygenic risk score, let's say 0 0.7. 
And alpha and beta, we estimate here alpha and beta from parameters which we actually know. We know all the numbers. K here is the disease prevalence in the population or of subpopulation of interest, because we know that in neurodegenerative disorders, the older you are, the uh, higher prevalence in all the groups, in all the subpopulations. What else here? Sigma no, not in sigma one, it's a um, standard deviation of the polygenic risk scores in cases and controls. And uh, what else? M1 and M0, it's a means of um, polygenic risk score distributions in cases and controls. So that's it what we need to know. So here we have R0, R1. They all can be expressed in terms K, population um, uh, prevalence in the subset of interest M0, M1 means of the PRS distribution in cases and in controls and sigma one, sigma naught. It's standard deviations of those, uh, of those distributions. Important to mention that of course standardization, what are this M0, M1, et cetera. So if we just take a sample and do exactly the same pruning and thresholding parameters, we still can end up with such a, with huge differences in the distributions, right? It's unstandardized here, so you see the, value on the x-axis is something irrelevant, but also what we can see in thousand genomes, the distribution of the PRS appears to be shifted as compared to our local sample cases and controls in Alzheimer's disease. Of course, what happens here, we have simply different sets of SNPs which contribute in, uh, into these two um, different uh, samples. And due to uh, different SNPs contributing, Although the uh, uh, PRS parameters calculations are exactly the same, we have these differences. People suggest to standardize it. If we standardize it within the sample, now you see it's standardized cases and controls, it's the same sample as here. We see something between minus four and four. However, again, in any sample, it will be uh, standardization sample specific. What we suggested to do, and we published it in our paper in Nature Communications in 2021, to standardize it against the population. In this case, we have 1,000 genome population, European, which is obviously uh, available for all researchers. And then we take, merge these three together, as you would do for principal component analysis, and standardize against mean and standard deviation uh, standardize our sample against mean and standard deviation in the population. In this way, we make a distribution comparable across all studies. So I will say that my case, my case, whatever my individual have polygenic risk score for as compared to thousand genomes. So that makes um, our studies comparable between each other. Now, coming back to our uh, results, uh, uh, of calculation disease probability. So what we've done here, uh, we simulated uh, a sample of 10,000 cases, 10,000 controls. Uh, we have taken effect sizes as they are published for the nine, well, APOE, real effect size, uh, uh, 39 genome wide significant SNPs, also real effect sizes, and I simulated extra uh, 10,000 SNPs just for to introduce a polygenic component with effect sizes comparable um, uh, with uh, small effect sizes from GWASs. What we can see here, so the red line shows uh, these um, the most discrepancies. Oh, sorry, the most discrepancies between estimated uh, using our formulas. So this uh, straight line is using the formula and crosses those which we get from the logistic regression. And the differences come uh, simply because uh, these red uh, values are is oligogenic score. Well, let's say it like this. So basically APOE plus um, 39 genome-wide significant SNPs, 40 SNPs overall. And distribution of this variable because of strong APOE effect is not Gaussian. So we have this, we can see the discrepancies. If we remove APOE from this score, we, we have perfect, uh, the formula and the uh, regression shows exactly the same values. And if you include APOE and have many uh, other SNPs uh, in the polygenic risk score, they also perfectly, perfectly matched. So that is, that is good. Just to show that the formula is actually makes sense. And then from the regression analysis, we get exactly the same estimates. Now, the next step, we just here using our formula, 
and we show different estimates in different subgroups of interest. So general population prevalence of the disease two percent, uh, population of age sixty five plus prevalence is ten percent, and population of age eighty five plus prevalence thirty percent. And we show the estimates using uh, polygenic risk score dashed line. Next one is APOE on its own. Next one is uh, oligogenic risk score. And the last one, the red one, it's a, a PRS AD, I call it, or, or basically PRS or prediction accuracy when we use AD, uh, sorry, APOE and PRS as the two variables. So that shows the best prediction. And you can see that, of course, the um, uh, older your population is, the higher the probabilities, as you would expect. The blue one is, uh, in fact, the 65 plus, and the general population, uh, the, uh, the generally disease probability is not that high, obviously, because we're looking at the whole uh, population. And here we have PRS value. So when your PRS value increases, your probability of the disease increases as well. Uh, next one, how do we model APOE? How do we account for differences in APOE allofrequencies with age. So as I mentioned already, variance in APOE gene highly affect the AD, odds ratio is about three, minor allofrequency in average 0.14, if you don't account for age. Uh, also APOE associated with lower odds of reaching uh, over 19th percentile age, as it is modifies age at onset. E4, E4 carriers are more likely to develop other conditions associated with lower uh, life expectancy. And also since age is a major confounding factor to the ID risk or neurodegenerative diseases uh, risk, it is difficult to disentangle the aging and disease pathogenic component. And yet we would like to predict the disease. <laughs> so what we suggest here to do is to recalculate frequencies, uh, prevalences, K0, K1, and K2, uh, with, re with respect to uh, people if they are APOE4, in this case only we just looked at APOE, APOE4 non-carriers, K0, APOE uh, heterozygous, so one APOE E4 allele, or um, uh, E4, E4 uh, homozygous. So we recalculate these frequencies. What's again good about this, all these frequencies could be calculated using uh, odds ratio for APOE, prevalence of the disease in the population and uh, frequency. And that's it. Uh, of course, we require a couple of assumptions here. Uh, we also uh, assume here hardy weinberg equilibrium of both uh, of these alleles, both in the general population and uh, in the subpopulation. That is an assumption here. So, and using now, instead of uh, K in the original formula, which I've shown you before, we're using K0, K1, and K2. And we can calculate probability of a disease in different uh, APOE carriers group. So if we look at uh, polygenic risk without APOE, that's a dashed line here, the black one, blue one will be lower probability in E4 non-carriers, as you would expect. If you have one E4 allele, then you have a higher probability then PRS no APOE. And then if you have uh, further uh, two APOE4 alleles, the probability is the highest. So basically we recalculate uh, influence of the APOE carriers uh, of APOE alleles in the using three different disease prevalences. And that is we've done for 65 uh, disease prevalence 10%. And that we've done for each group of uh, 85 plus disease pre prevalence is 30%, obviously they go higher. Now, talking about rare variants, uh, because PRS is captured to design, uh, designed to capture the risk of common variants, it aggregates the effects of a known genome wide associated loss and losses that do not reach genome wide um, statistical significance. However, PRS uh, may not reflect the effects of rare variants. For example, in, uh, for AD, it's known TREM2, PLCG2, ABCA3, SOR1. And also a very highly penetrant mutation in AP, PIPs, and 1 and PSIN2 genes. And so, uh, assuming that LD between common and rare variants are small, is small. And here I've given an example that if you take a typical, well, uh, ma ma uh, rare variant with minor rare frequency 1% and common SNP with 2%, uh, um, 
between these two alleles, the maximum R squared is 0 0.04. Practically, they are if d prime is equal to 1. So they are kind of, you can assume that they are kind of independent. And then what we suggest to do in this case, we su suggest to include them as uh, uh, the overall probability as sum of probability attributed to the PRS and x value is a uh, value as a PRS for a particular individual and plus probability of uh, rare variance. Well, obviously adjusted one minus PRS uh, probability attributed to PRS. What is again nice, nice here, we have shown it in the paper that we can calculate a probability of the uh, when you have a rare variant using the prevalence as before and odds ratio for this rare variant. And that's a picture showing how the probability of the disease changes if we add a rare variant. For example, here we have red and, uh, and black lines. The red line is we look at the population 65 plus and the black line uh, population uh, general population prevalence two uh, percent. Uh, so if you have a PRS only, that's uh, in the population that will be dashed line. When you have a rare variant, in this case SOR one, so we take the real effect size from SOR one. So no matter what your PRS is, the probability is higher, systematically higher than uh, uh, based on PRS alone. Obviously, if you the similar applies to the um, probability attributed to the PRS in 65 plus is getting higher of PRS is higher, but also uh, if you have this rare variant, your probability starts at a high level and then it adds some uh, PRS component on top. Here we have calculated similar um, picture, but with TREM2. TREM2 have lower effect size and obviously the probability jumps up uh, lesser than in the previous picture. In this way, we can incorporate two, three rare variants if they happen to be together in the same individuals, which uh, which unlikely, of course, but we can put this all together. So in conclusion, first, standardizing PRS against the population mean, as opposed to the sample mean, makes individual scores comparable between studies. Uh, PRS do not directly indicate uh, an individual's liability to develop a disease, and it, because it depends on a variety of uh, study parameters, just uh, how we selected SNPs, how many of them included in the PRS, and therefore again it might not be make uh, be comparable between the studies. Our calculation of a disease probability takes PRS distribution in cases and controls into account, and also provides a unified measure to access a PRS uh, to ask. Uh, assess a PRS value in view of the PRS distribution and disease prevalence in the population, or importantly, of a, a subpopulation of interest. Uh, the impact of common high effect variants like APOE can vary due to confounders like age stratification. So taking summary effect size from a reference study may result is in not so optimal PRS. And that I've shown to you uh, in the pictures when we have uh, two variables included to the prediction of the disease, two variables, PRS without APOE and uh, APOE as a separate variable. And finally, the effect of rare, highly, highly penetrant genetic variants may be masked by more common SNPs, especially if there are many of them included together. However, if they do not affect the disease prevalence in the population since they are rare, and act independently of the PRS since they're rare, we can account for them directly as adding a certain intrinsic probability for carriers of the risk allele, only for the, for the carriers. So that's basically it what I wanted to um, talk to you about. Again, I repeat, uh, I have uh, demonstrated this, um, uh, the work of these formulas uh, for neurodegenerative disorders, I think uh, they might, they can be applicable for other disorders. In addition, be because our formulas are taken, it's very quick to calculate, it's just several lines in our script, and it doesn't need to have samples or subsamples and anything else, you just plug in the parameters of the distribution, and here is your results. Thank you very much for listening. Um, hopefully, uh, it's interesting, have been interesting for you and very open for collaboration, sharing my scripts and anything related to that. Thank you.